seated. Welcome back. It's Friday, so um, we can start this morning with closing. So, Ms. Dayton, whenever you're ready, you can proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Any please, plaintiffs, jury, um, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to thank you for being here. I really do. As we discussed before, this is a significant part of our justice system, and we really do appreciate you being here. Thank you for the attention that you paid throughout the trial. And um, this is the part of the trial where you're now going to get to start answering some questions about the evidence that you have seen. So before I talk about the evidence, I want to tell you what the evidence was. The evidence was the testimony that you heard. Yes, the evidence was the records that you've seen, the photographs that you've seen. The evidence was not, however, what I say and what plaintiff's counsel says. Okay? The evidence is the other elements, and the judge will tell you more about that later. Um, but over the last few days, you have heard a lot of evidence, and you have acquired um, some knowledge as a result of that evidence. I'm going to argue that evidence was presented to you that shows that my clients and clients had no negligence in connection with this incident occurring this fire. Um, as you consider the evidence, I want you to view it through the lens of the burden, which is on the plaintiff. They do not have the burden of proof. So, I'm going first with my summation, not because I lost something to us, but because the plaintiff has the burden of proof, so he gets to have the last legs in some of the case. But remember, hold them to their burden of proof throughout this. Let me also say that I always forget something during my summation, which is why I'm reading some things to you off of my head. And I try to address all the issues that I think were important, but invariably I end up forgetting something. And once I sit down, I'm done. I can't stand back up and come and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I want to talk about that, I want to point that out. So I ask you to um, consider the evidence, consider what plaintiff's counsel says, and consider what I would say in countering that based on the evidence. And then you're going to take that and you together with the law as the judge tells it to you, and you're going to render a verdict in this matter. Now, things that I think are important for you to consider. I'm going to suggest these things to you, and you don't have to consider them. I'm just suggesting them to you because I think that they're important matters for you to consider as you deliberate. To begin with, you heard a lot of testimony about my client, Seven Hill Transportation, through my client, Eunice Porter Robbery. Um, the truck was parked on a property located at 5244 through 130 in Bordentown, and the truck and the building both went on fire. Mr. Porter Robbery gave testimony, and plaintiff's counsel. Uh, tried very hard to show my client as being non credible in some of his responses, but I'm going to go through some of that with you and tell you why I think that you should consider my client quite credible. First of all, Eunice Burnabu is a young man who started a business while he was still in high school. He finished high school, he is attending college, he's working the whole time. And he volunteers for the last three years with the East Hampton and Lumberton Fire Department. He also just attended an interview for a police department. Um, I submit to you that he is a credible witness. So um, he might have made some mistakes during his testimony, forgotten things, got a little tongue tied. But I submit to you that he is. Um, a very credible witness. And don't forget, he was under a bit of pressure when he was answering responses, so I submit he's quite a credible witness. Um, let's start with the 
place where the truck was parked on the day of the accident. So I think that sheds light too on the plaintiffs and their credibility. Now, you heard my client testify that it was his understanding that the truck could be parked in that position where it was parked on the day of the accident. By the way, you heard that the accident occurred August 17th of 2017. Okay, you can take a look at uh, what's been marked as plaintiff's 30, which shows you the location where the truck was parked. My client testified that he believed that, that there was an agreement that the truck could park there. there he believed there was an agreement that plaintiffs were getting paid for his truck being parked there. Plaintiffs tell you there's no agreement. We didn't make any agreement. Okay. So when um, when the plaintiffs were deposed, they both told you about how they entered into a lease for the property, and that lease is. Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. You can take a look at that lease. The lease is expired in 2015, as you know. And they both told you, oh, well, there was an oral agreement with the landlord that we could continue living here using this property. So they made that oral agreement. Then there was the situation of no tractor trailers being allowed on the property. Oh, well, it wasn't amended, the lease wasn't amended in any way, but the landlord gave us an oral agreement that we could park the tractor trailer on the property. Okay? That's oral agreement that the lease continues, oral agreement that they could park the tractor trailer on the property. And Mr. Ozdemir said, testified, that his wife's trucks parked on the property as well and paid money to some entity. The two of them were in town, I'm unclear. But there was an oral agreement. You remember me going over and over, but it was an oral agreement. Yes, there was an oral agreement in place. So is it so far-fetched to believe that there was an oral agreement with Mr. Bordoraglu's company, Seven Hill Trucking, to park their trucks on that property? We now have evidence of three oral agreements, and he's saying that he had that oral agreement too. Now, let's look at a couple of other things regarding that. Um, you heard testimony that Mr. Bordoraglu's father was friends with Mr. Osterman. In fact, they were such good friends, you heard that testimony, that Omar's father volunteered him to act as a translator for Mr. Osterman in some legal matter. That's quite a friend, although Mr. Osterman did try to step away from it a bit. Is it so far-fetched to believe that Mr. Osborne would enter into an oral agreement with a friend of his to park a truck on the property that he was leasing and get paid for. I'm going to also ask you to take a look at the business lease that was in effect at the time before the accident. Uh, fire, I usually do accident cases, so I'm used to saying accident, but if I say accident, which it was, um, I, I might mean fire. Um, so, this lease says on it, limit six trucks, okay? We heard about four trucks being parked on the property. We heard where the town trucking didn't own any trucks. We heard about four trucks parked on the property. Two belonged to Mr. Zavali, who has the company Zavali Trucking. And the other, the other trucks belong to the wife of Mr. Osmer. In fact, his wife's company, Lucky Trucking, okay? And again, that company paid to park the trucks on this property. Is it credible to believe that 
they would not have tried to maximize the amount of trucks that they could park on the property based on the lease, six trucks, in order to maximize their income for the property? I submit to you that it's perfectly credible that they had a piece of property that they leased that they could park six trucks on. They had four trucks, not of their own, mind you, because those trucks belonged to separate companies, but that they allowed to park on their property. And then they had an oral agreement with a friend of theirs to park his truck on that property. I submit to you the answer is no, that is not so. And that is very credible that that is exactly what happened, that Mr. Where Wild Blue is correct in stating that there was an oral agreement that allowed his company's truck to park on the property. And that I turned to that friend of yours. These people were not strangers. They knew each other. And filling an empty parking space on a piece of property that you're renting for business, well, that makes sense. Let me talk a little bit more about the uh, relationship between the parties. You heard the plaintiffs testify that they're from the same community and attend the same mosque. Again, these people are friends. You don't volunteer your son to translate for, for somebody who needs legal translation if you're not some sort of a friend. And again, uh, I submit that that is evidence, very strong evidence, that there was this oral agreement to park the truck on the property, though they deny it. Okay, now, there was also um, evidence that you heard from the plaintiffs that they never told anyone from Seven Hill Trucking that they could park on the property, and they never told anyone from Seven Hill Trucking that they couldn't park on the property because they never saw the truck from Seven Hill Park trucking parked on the property. But I'm going to ask you to take a look at what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 1. Which was signed by Mr. Osborne and was signed by Mr. Zavali. And Mr. Zavali is a representative of the Board of Town Truck. And in that exchange, they have a statement that says he had been told before not to park there, referencing presumably Mr. Ward Rob. And yet, Mr. Ward Rob says that's not so. And the plaintiffs testified they never saw the truck park there and they never told him not to. But they signed a document with the certification page that states, I hereby certify the foregoing answers to interrogatories are true. I am aware that if any of the foregoing statements made by me are willfully false, I am subject to punishment. They signed that. Now, Mr. Osborne tried to tell you, well, I just trusted my lawyer and I just signed it. But isn't that exactly the kind of um, difficulties Mr. Moles gave to my client when he was sitting there and he said he signed? what was marked as plaintiff's exhibit four regarding his answers to interrogatories. If my client does not appear credible because of that, I submit to you that the plaintiffs do not appear credible because they signed a document which has information that they can't even say occurred. Now, let me step aside for another moment in, in this document in case you, you read it carefully. You'll see that it says, the gentleman's driver parked the truck near the building and left. About five minutes later, there was a report of a fire that engulfed the building. But none of them were there at the time of the fire. You heard them testify they weren't present at the time of the fire. Nor was my client. So how did they know that? How did they know what happened with this fire? How did they know when it started? How did they know where it started? How did they know how it started? I submit to you that they certainly don't. And there's been no evidence to the contrary. 
Okay, let me talk a little bit more about the truck and where it was parked on the property. So, um, both Mr. Zavali and Mr. Osmer testified that there was a gate, a closed in area on the side of the property with a gate there, which is shown in what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 3-0 and also Plaintiff's Exhibit 3-N. And I think there's, a, there's another one there too, but these are the ones that I'm going to focus on for the moment. And I submit to you, well, let me first talk about the gate. So there's a gate closing off this little area next to the building with a lock on it. And what's kept inside that? Used tires. You have dump trucks parked on your property and you lock used tires up? All right, now there was a little bit of a difference between the plaintiffs. One of them thought that there were new tires in there as well as used tires. The other one said no used tires. Why would you keep those in a locked area on your property when you have valuable dump trucks sitting on the property as well? I submit to you that's because they actually use that area to park their dump trucks. Now, supposedly, on the day of the incident, this um, area was cleared of all debris, or, I'm sorry, cleared of all the tires, all the used tires, okay? Mr. Zavali testified he paid somebody $10 to remove the tires, $10 to remove the tires. And so, and here's where I scratch my head too, if you don't want anybody parking in a closed, enclosed area that has a gate with a lock, you fill it up with used tires, once you take all the used tires out, you leave the gates open, now you heard testimony about this no parking sign that was on the gate. But as you can see in the photographs, once the gates are open, you can't see the no parking sign to the extent that it was even there, which I'll get to more of that in a moment as well. But if the no parking sign actually did exist at the time of the fire, it's on the outside of the gate that you're now leaving open so that the vehicle can park inside the gate area. That just doesn't, I submit to you, that just doesn't make sense. I submit to you that that just is incredible. Now, a little bit more about that gate. In Plaintiff's Exhibit 3P, you can see the gate that opens toward the building. Okay? There's, no, there's no sign on that. Right. And the plaintiffs testified that there was a sign on the gate. So then take a look at, at what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit P5. And by the way, supposedly the sign said no parking. Well, the gate that we see in P5 has two signs on it. My eyes are not that good. But they're good enough to see that the sign doesn't say no parking. My client testified to you that the top sign was the address of the property, the wait sign, and the bottom sign said, warning, authorized personnel only. Now, you had an agreement, be it oral, with somebody to park your truck on their property, wouldn't you consider yourself to be an authorized personnel? And I submit to you that that's exactly what went on with this truck, with Seven Mills truck. They considered themselves to be authorized personnel, and they were allowed to park the truck there. And they paid money to do that. Now another thing I want to point out to you regarding the truck was I'm anticipating the plaintiff's counsel is going to say that the truck was parked improperly there and that's what caused this whole problem. But I submit to you that if you take a look at the exhibits that have been marked Plaintiff's 3N and Plaintiff's 3-0. You can see that truck is parked where other trucks have been parked before. This, this fire occurred in August. 
These plaintiffs had been leasing the property from 2014, November 2014. So they've had the property for two and a half years. They've gone for three summers. And here it is, August of 2017. And there's no grass growing there in the gravel. There's no weeds growing there in the gravel underwear chalk parks. You can see that along the sides where chucks wouldn't drive through and park. In fact, I submit that if you look closely at these photographs, you can even see the, tra the track marks for where Chuck drives on there regularly. This was not some new thing that my client suddenly parked this truck randomly on this property without permission. This truck had been parked there before. A truck had been parked there before. So obviously there was nothing wrong with parking a truck there. And I submit to you that my client's truck was the one that was parked there before, at least until Mr. Zavali purchased his, uh, or before Mr. Z after Mr. Zavali purchased his tractor trailer, which would not fit into that closed, enclosed area. I submit that that is evidence to you that this truck was not improperly parked on that property. It was parked exactly where it was supposed to be parked due to an oral agreement which the plaintiffs had with my client. Now, um, My client did not provide records of repairs and that sort of maintenance of his truck. He testified to the fact that those records were inside of his vehicle. And I'm sure plaintiff's counsel will try to make a big deal out of that. But you did hear my client's testimony, and I submit to you again that my client is a credible witness that the documents were inside the truck, and he did not realized he had access to documents um, and, and didn't provide any documents regarding the maintenance of his truck. But they did do the maintenance of the truck. But they did make sure that that truck, which was the workhorse, his word, not mine, of the company, Seven Hill Trucking, was in good shape. So it could be on the road and do the job that they had it to do. Now, again, going back to the truck being on the property because it, it's, it's just so important, I think, to the credibility of the witnesses here. This is a dump truck, okay? 20 feet, I believe Mr. Osborne told us, the dump truck was about 20, 22 feet. That's a big dump truck. Is it really believable that they never saw that truck on their property? Is it really believable that that truck snuck in after business hours and remained on the property unseen? In fact, on the day of the incident, that truck was there and neither Mr. Zavali or Mr. Austin were there. Presumably they came back to the property afterward. Um, they would have seen the truck there. The truck was parked in the middle of the, it, it, on an August day. It was laid out. We, Mr. Osborne testified to the time that he returned to the property. I believe that was somewhere around 3.30, 4.30. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is, he testified it was still light out. Is it believable that a big dump truck comes onto the property, backs up into this parking space, which is shown I guess the best photos were 3N and 3P. Backs into this parking space next to the building, the front of the building, in order to hide. Is that credible? Is that credible? I submit to you that no, it is not credible. That truck was supposed to be there. That was an agreement that they had, and the truck was parked there because it had an agreement. So, yes, there's no maintenance records. My client testified the truck was in good shape. Um, there's 
there's nothing inherently dangerous about a parked truck. Okay? This truck was parked at the time this fire occurred. There's no evidence that a parked truck, even if it wasn't well maintained, goes up in flames. There's no evidence of that. Um, now, another thing is that the truck was parked on that property and went up in flames. The building also was in flames. And while I submit to you that we don't know the order of those two things, and nobody witnessed the fire, and we don't know how it happened, but I will say this, if you, if, if the plaintiffs came to their property and saw this truck sitting there that they had never told that it could sit there, and they believe that that truck started the fire to their building, and they don't know these people who parked this truck here, and they never gave up permission to do that, In fact, the landlord said, according to my client, for him to remove the truck from the property that night. Why didn't they have him arrested? Wouldn't that be breaking and entering or criminal trespass or wouldn't there be some criminal charge available to some random truck that came onto your property and parked and you believe that it caused your building to burn? That didn't happen. You heard a testimony. The landlord said, property owner told my client to move the truck off the property. He did. Got it off the property that night. Now, um, plaintiff's counsel probably say that my client never provided an opportunity for his clients to examine the truck. But they never asked to. You heard my client testify. They never asked to examine the truck. And at some stage of the game, he disposed of it. I submit to you that that's perfectly credible. There was also a little statement that was made by, I believe it was plaintiff's counsel, but I just want to make sure to address it here now too, that the um, truck was parked in a, in a drive through type of area, roadway I think the word was. Um, if you remember me speaking that in mind, but I submit to you that if you look at Exhibit 3N, that photograph. And you look to the back of where that truck is, there's a fence behind it. That's not a roadway. That's not an area that trucks are driving through. So if they tr tries to say that trucks drove through there, that's why there's the gravel tracks. That's why there's no grass or weeds growing. Don't believe that. That's not credible. There's a fence behind it. And there's shrubbery behind it. August, the height of the growing season. No grass, no gravel, well, no grass on the gravel, no weeds on the gravel. That truck was parked where it was supposed to be. And somehow the truck did go up in the waves. Again, the parking sign, they didn't. But it was testified to, but didn't, clearly didn't exist on the fence at the time of the fire. Um. Now let's go to the fire a little bit. There's no testimony whatsoever about how this fire started. Okay. In fact, you haven't heard from a single witness who was present when the fire started. All we know is that the truck was in flames and the building burned and some of the property inside burned. Now, Mr. Osmer testified that he worked on trucks inside the building. Isn't it just as possible that the fire started inside the building on this hot August day, do something that he had been doing inside the building while working on a truck. Fire could have started in the building and could have been up in the top of the building and put sparks onto the truck. That's just as 
possible as the fire started in the truck. Based on the testimony that we've got here, we have gotten no testimony as to how the fire started. But we do know that Mr. Osborne was working inside the building working on trucks at some point. And I submit to you that if you take a look at what's been marked as defendants 3H, okay, there's a lot of barrels and such in that photograph. There's a lot of debris that we don't know what it is. Okay. Could have been the source of the fire just as likely as the truck. We don't know. There's no testimony as to how the fire started. Now you're going to have some questions about whether the truck was in the exclusive control of my client, and I'm going to submit to you that, from my understanding of that, um, the judge will give you what the law says, but the truck did drive on public roadways. My client testifies that the truck drove on public roadways. Testifies the fact that there's plastic bags on roadways, there's there's debris on roadways, there's leaves on roadways, and in fact, if you take a look at the exhibit that's been marked, plaintiff's exhibit three and you can see in that that there's debris in the area where the truck is parked. It's possible that some of that debris was woven in flames. It's possible that some of that debris caused the truck to go into flames. There is no testimony as to how this truck fire occurred. None whatsoever. It's burdens on the plaintiffs. Mr. Osborne testified to a camera inside the building and wiring that was done. That could have been the start of the fire as well. There's no evidence as to how this fire started. And again, the burden is on the point. Take a look at what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit five. In that photograph, we don't know where that fire started. No one does, because no one was there. No one was there to observe the fire. Even though the plaintiff signed a document saying that the driver walked away and the fire started within five minutes. Well, 
There's some questions that you're going to have to answer in the jury verdict. And the first one says, have the plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant, Seven Hill Trucking, LLC, was negligent and that the defendant's negligence was approximate cause of the incident of the 1717? And I submit to you that the answer to that should be no. Because you haven't seen any evidence of how the fire started, of what caused the fire, of where the fire started. You haven't seen any evidence of any of that. You have people who said they were not present at the time of the fire and had no independent knowledge of anything about how the fire started. So I submit to you that the response to that is no. Now, if for some reason you disagree with that, and you do think that my client had some sort of negligence that caused this fire, then you're going to move to the next question on the verdict. And the next question is, if a plaintiff is proven by a preponderance of evidence that they sustained damages approximately caused by the incident of 8-17-17. And I submit to you that they really didn't. That there's really not a whole lot of damages here that they've proven occurred as a result of this fire. So let's talk about a couple of things there. There's some testimony regarding this lease that they had where they had a property that they were renting for $1,200 a month and that because of the fire, they're no longer able to use that property. But we haven't heard from anyone who said why they're not able to use that property. Other than the plaintiffs who I submit to you are not very credible. We know that they had a tractor trailer on the property that wasn't supposed to be there according to the lease. Okay? Plaintiffs' counsel will probably try to provide information or will probably try to summarize information regarding Mr. Zavalli's statements that it's been difficult to replace that piece of property for a rental. But Mr. Zavalli testified all he's done is talk to people driven around and look in the papers. Is that a whole lot of effort put into trying to find a new piece of property to rent? I submit to you that the answer to that is no. So if you do go so far as to answer yes to both of those questions, then you move on to what amount of money would fairly and reasonably compensate plaintiffs. Gordon Town Truck, Yusuf Zavalli, Orhan Ozdemir, and Leal Gonsalves. Now we didn't hear from Mr. Gonsalves, so we don't know what his damages are. Okay? As far as Gordon Town, Mr. Zavalli, and Mr. Ozdemir. You have a package that says Plaintiffs Exhibit 2. It's a handwritten list of the damages that they claim they sustained as a result of the fire. Gordon Town Truck is a company. What kind of company? A company that they were collecting, according to their testimony, it had never opened up. They had had the company since 2014. Today is 2020. Well, we just finished 2019. They never once filed a tax return on it because it never opened up. The company never opened up. They never filed taxes. They were collecting inventory for the company. That's what they were doing. They were collecting inventory for the company. Is this the kind of list you would keep if you were collecting inventory for a company that you were about to open or you were waiting to open? I mean, some of these parts that are on here are not even parts that are identified. MN parts, MN parts, MN parts. 
tractor parts. It's quite an inventory list for a company that you were in collecting inventory and had And that brings me to another point. Um, the property that's in this list that is stated to be purchased by Zavali Trucking is not property that was owned by the Louisiana Trucking. It's not property that was owned by Mr. Zavali, and it's not property that was owned by Mr. Austin. That's property that was owned by Zavali Trucking. A completely separate entity from Morgantown Trucking, from Mr. Ostemer, and from Mr. Zavali. So, you heard Mr. Zavali testify that 85% of these receipts were the things that were in the building for the time of the fire. 85%. Right? You could tell us which 85% that's for you, the jurors, to decide, I suppose. But 85% of these receipts are items that were inside the building at the time of the fire. And some of these receipts are from 2014. Is it really credible that, that these materials that were bought in 2014 were just sitting inside this building all that time for no reason not being touched? You heard Mr. Ostermer testify that he did work on trucks inside the building. Little things, changing hoses, tires, that sort of thing. Well, take a look at some of these parts. I can't tell you what, what truck parts are used for what. And some of them aren't even identified as to what they are. But I submit to you that these are not parts that were sitting inside of this building, unused, for no purpose, okay? These were parts that were being used for some other purpose, perhaps related to Mr. Ostemer's wife's company when he worked on her trucks. Perhaps to Mr. Zavali's trucking company's company. But you can go through these and you can decide if you get so far as damages, which I submit that you shouldn't because there's no negligence. But if you get so far as damages, you can go through these and you can decide which of these documents really um, was property that was owned by either Gordon Town Truck, Recept Zavali, or Orhan Osdemer. Again, we don't know what was owned by Mr. Nisi. Uh, some of these receipts or some of these invoices are marked paid. Some of these invoices aren't marked paid. Some of these are some sort of receipt that doesn't say what it's for or what it's all about. Not signed at all. We know that there's receipts for law in here. We know that there's at least one invoice for a piece of property that was uh, dated after the accident. And so there's no evidence that that was actually a purchased piece of property, whether it was purchased for or a truck, volley trucking, lucky trucks, you know, because there's no proof of that. Remember, or it's on the plaintiff to provide you with that I'm not going to belabor the point of the receipts because I don't think you'll get to that, but if you do, you can go through those and I submit to you that the amount. 85% as testified to by Mr. Zavali of these receipts actually being things that is in, inside the building at the time of the fire is probably significant. Maybe 10%, maybe not anything. 
And also bear in mind that parts that were purchased in 2014 may not have the same value today as they sat around inside of a building for three years. So, I'm just about done. Um, I want to comment on you and press on you that the verdict sheet's going to be yours. Your decision. You're going to render the decision on that. There has been no evidence as to how this fire started. All we know is that it did start. There has been no evidence as to where it started. All we know is that the truck burned, the property burned. There has been no evidence as to when it started, regardless of the document that was signed by the plaintiffs that contains other information. They, they couldn't know because they weren't there, and nobody's presented any evidence of that time. Additionally, my client did have an oral agreement with the plaintiffs. I submit to you to park his vehicle on that property, exactly where it was parked on the day of the fire. But my client did not provide you with any maintenance records. As he testified, they were inside the truck. They got burned. He suffered that loss as well. And for those reasons, I submit to you finally, that the answer to that has got to be no. And I, once again, thank you all for your time. Thank you for being here. And wish you luck.